guys, I am down here at the original Aqua Green water cremation or flameless cremation facility. And I'm so excited. It's not often that in the business that you've been in for so long, you can see something that's completely new and innovative. Even if it's been around for a while, you get your first exposure to it. So I'm so excited to be here today to learn about the process, to share with you guys. So we're gonna go and we're gonna meet with Ryan and he's gonna tell us all about flameless cremation. Hello, my name's Ryan Catoni from Aqua Green Dispositions. We offer flameless cremation, which is a greener, gentler form of cremation. Uh, we are located in the Chicagoland area of Illinois, and we are happy to serve families from all over the country, basically. I was a junior in high school, and my grandfather uh, lived with us, so I was very close with him. And he uh, passed away, um, and the funeral director just really helped us with the grievance and closure. And at that time, junior, you're kind of looking where to go with your life. Right. And I figured if I could do that, um, give people the comfort that they gave us, I'd truly be making a difference. Um, so I started researching it, uh, went to mortuary school, um, went to one year of college before that, got my prereqs. I went to Wars or Warsham College in Wheeling, um, became a licensed funeral director. Uh, before 21, I couldn't even drink at the graduation <laughs> ceremony, so I was the youngest one in my class. Wow. And um, originally I wanted to own funeral homes uh, going into school. Um, I got graduated, I worked at a funeral home, and I just, um, I just wasn't very comfortable where I was at. So um, I was reading a trade journal and seeing that Mayo Clinic was using this process for their donated body program. Um, and once I read that, I started uh, doing research about it because Mayo Clinic is the innovator in everything. Mm -hmm. um, so once I started doing research, I visited the manufacturer. Um, I just truly knew this was a much better way of cremation, in my opinion, or um, you know, basically process. And um, once I seen it, I just knew this would be the wave of the future. Um, it's just much better for the environment and much gentler on the body. So uh, once I started researching it, I started working with legislation uh, to bring regulation here in Illinois. Um, that took about two years. And then in September of 2012, uh, the law got passed, and then I opened up in uh, September of 2012, basically. So. Mm -hmm. And you're the only one in Illinois? Only one in Illinois, yes. Uh, right now, I think there's currently only four other or five other in the U.S. Um, it's Maine, Minnesota, Florida, and I think that in Illinois, that is kind of real, so. You know what, I was originally calling it alkaline hydrolysis when I first started, um, and then I, you know, then we went to uh, flameless cremation, and flameless cremation is a very good word for it, because you tell somebody alkaline hydrolysis, they have no idea what right. that is, but everybody's heard of cremation, and then you hear flameless cremation, um, and they go, well, how does that work? So it's a nice icebreaker to describe the process, basically. So I prefer flameless cremation. I know there's a lot of different terms out there for yeah. it. Um, some are trademarked and things like that. So, uh, but I found that flameless cremation works very well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Since uh, the way it got passed in Illinois is under cremation, um, so we have had the honor of serving families from all over the U.S. Uh, because it is cremation, so we just put cremation removal from state. Um, and then we could perform the process basically. So uh, we have served funeral homes and families from all over the U.S. basically. Okay, so legality wise, why is this not more widespread? The reason why it's not more widespread, I believe, is it, there's nothing wrong with the process. It's more that there's just no rules and regulation in process or in, um, in written down. Um, and my opinion is that they don't want just anybody to do it. They want some rules and regulations. Uh, the funeral industry is kind of a slow changing industry right. and unless there is a large interest or somebody actually wanting to do it, I don't think they're going to actually go and change the law. Um, plus I think a lot of people are kind of waiting to see how it takes off before they make the big investment because the machines are much more than a regular retort. Um, so I think it's kind of a combination of things of why it's not widespread all over basically um, is one of the reasons. Okay. So when you went through legislature, what was your biggest hoop you had to jump through? Uh, just learning how politics works. Yes. It's a whole other world. <laughs> um, I'll never do that again. <clears throat> but um, it's just um, trying to educate and inform people of how the actual process works and just talking to as many people as you can to get everybody on board with it. Gotcha. Um, 
there's so much misinformation about the process that people don't know how it works. Once you inform them how it works, they go, oh, that's really nice, or oh, I really like that. Um, we heard so-and-so about this, and once you clear up that misinformation, everybody really likes the process, basically. So um, The process is 95% uh, water and 5% alkalis. The alkalis that are used are found in your everyday household items, such as beauty supplies, cleaning supplies. Um, it's just a pure form. And basically what happens is the loved one's placed in a special machine we have, and uh, the machine will fill with water. Um, heat and gently circulate until all that remains is the bone remain and any body imp or implants. Uh, so basically the body is just broken down into its most basic organic elements. The bone remain is so brittle it will break down into a powder. Uh, we put that into the urn and give it back to the family so the family can still um, scatter the cremated remains, keep them at home, make glass, make a vinyl record. Anything you do with cremated remains you could do with these as well too. Okay. Um, so you achieve the same end result as regular cremation. There's just no 1800 degree heat. There's no fossil fuels being burned, um, no air emissions. Uh, the machine does not have any huge smokestacks or anything like that. So um, it's just a greener, gentler form of cremation, essentially. So is it a lye that you're using? Uh, it is. It is potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. Um, they're both naturally derived. Um, they're you know, found in a lot of everyday household items. Um, that you use on a typical daily basis. I was truly actually amazed. Uh, the um, company told me that, and I was like, that can't be true. Um, so I went around my house, the store, just looking, and I was truly amazed at how many products had one or the other alkalis in them. Um, things as toothpaste, uh, beauty products, uh, hit lotions, hand creams, um, cleaning supplies. It's just very widespread, a lot more than people really know. So, um, but yes, they are uh, lies, they are alkalis. Um, which is one of the biggest misconceptions is that we use acid, um, which in reality it's alkaline hydrolysis, so it's the chemical opposite of an acid, basically. Okay. So are you literally dumping these, or no, does, they, is it an auto it's, system? No, it's, um, it is, uh, the way I buy the alkalis are in flake or pellet form, so if anybody ever dealt with a water softener, you buy 50 pound bags of salt. Um, I buy 50 pound bags of the alkalis, uh, so they're in bead and flake form and we add them to the machine before the loved one's in there and then um, once the machine fills it basically just circulates so okay mm -hmm. so are you doing like an equation yes like there is a formula, formula that um, so everything depends off the decedent's body weight um, and then once I know that then I can figure out how much uh, to add and things like that so how long does this process take from start to finish? it takes about six to eight hours um, where regular cremation takes about an hour and a half to three hours depending on machine body size like that. Um, so it is a lengthier process, however we don't use the natural resources of regular crematory wood, so it is still a pretty quick process for what we use natural resource wise. So the end um, solution is basically just made up of amino acids, soaps, uh, peptides, nutrients, um, just the basic building blocks of life. It's just our bodies are so nutrient dense. Um, that our bodies are broken into microscopic uh, atoms, basically. Um, so all that's left is the bone remain and metal implants, and the solution is returned to the normal wastewater treatment facility, um, just like an embalming would be. Okay. However, this is 100% sterile. Um, there's no DNA or RNA left, and all viruses, diseases, and prions are destroyed basically within minutes. You know, so. With regular crematories, you have to run them in the morning because if you get them too hot, you'll get right. a grease fire essentially. Right. Uh, with this process, you don't have to worry about any of that. You can run them any time of the day and everything like that. So. Interesting. Now, are they in like a basket? So that they you are. Kind of they are placed in a um, stainless steel basket. Um, which another nice thing with this is that nothing comes in or out of the stainless steel basket. Um, so if somebody has jewelry on that um, as people get older, their knuckles, so you can't get off before the cremation, um, this, the jewelry, will be left at the end of the cremation or after the flameless cremation. Um, and it gets cleaned during the process so you can give the jewelry back to the family. Uh, where in regular cremation that would have been lost due to the melting. You get 100% of your loved one back and only of your loved one. Um, you do get a little bit more cremated remains with this process just because of that fat. Um, so there's no commingling or anything like that. Um, the cremated remains are a little bit different than regular cremation. Um, they're more 
they're whiter in color just due to not being exposed to the intense heat of cremation. So they're in more of a natural white ivory color and they are much finer. They're more of a powdered sugar or flour consistency instead of being a campfire ash. So, Do you use a cremulator also? Yes, we use a regular uh, processor just like a regular crematory wood. Uh, the bones are so brittle we could do it by hand, uh, oh. but just for time it goes much quicker with that. So a tenth of a cremation, uh, the carbon footprint, um, it uses like 85% less energy than a regular crematory. Uh, it neutralizes all embalming fluids, chemotherapy drugs, um, other lifetime drugs the person might have been on, uh, and it releases nothing into the atmosphere. So yeah. it's a very okay. basic process. Um, the actual science has been around since 1888. Um, but it just, cremation was much easier, you know, it kind of just yeah. worked out. Um, but they use it for um, diseased animal remains as well too, the process. So if there's ever an outbreak of mad cow disease or whatever, um, they'll use this process. Or if there's, um, when scientists start studying new diseases, viruses, um, they'll basically put all the stuff in a smaller machine and gets rid of everything because it is such a sterile process. So That's new. Um, that getting the word out there is not challenging, but it's very hard. Um, advertising is very expensive, and then also a lot of funeral homes don't like change. Uh, some funeral <laughs> homes are just getting on board with regular cremation, even right. though it's over, you know, burials. Um, so it's kind of getting just your foot out there and getting the word out there. Right. Um, once people hear about it, they are very intrigued by it. Um, I guarantee once you mention flameless cremation to somebody, um, they'll ask you at least one question about it because it yeah. just doesn't make sense really. Um, but that's the way it got passed in Illinois it was under cremation so we had to use cremation in the word. So um, I wanted to do kind of a roundup from my on-site visit with Ryan at Aqua Green. It was so fascinating being there. We did not uh, do any video touring back in the facility just because of privacy. So we did our interview time, which you've seen, and then I just wanted to do this roundup of kind of information that I thought was really important during the time the together. Machine is all stainless steel. So from the workings of the machine itself to the basket that the person is placed in, and there is a bottom basket and there is a top basket. And I was struck by how heavy the basket is. It is you know, one person lifting it would be crazy. It's so heavy because it is solid stainless steel. But it also makes everything sterile. That's one thing that struck me as we were walking through. Ryan was, you know, touching the machine and, and touching the basket and, and touching things without even thinking about it. Whereas in a standard cremation facility or in a prep room, you would probably put on gloves. But he was just touching everything so freely and I said, what, you know, are you that confident that everything is sterile? And he said, yes, things are so sterile after this process that you don't, aren't concerned with, with touching or, or, or anything. So I thought that was really interesting that that sterilization happens. And it was cool to look at like the implants, the hip implants and things are all polished and shiny, whereas in the flame cremation, everything is, is tarnished and burnt, just like the disc. So in the regular, in a regular cremation, that metal disc with the number, identifying who that person is is put through the process. Same thing happens with the water cremation, but that little disc is all shiny and it's brand new, even shinier and prettier than brand new because of the process. So I thought that was really interesting. So when we walked back in the room, I was struck that there was no smell like there would be at a fire cremation facility. You know, the burning and the combustion type smell, I, I didn't experience any of that. And maybe when you are, you discharge the liquid after the process, there might be some kind of a smell, but there, it just, there wasn't any. And so that was interesting to me. Um, so the machine, it, some of the machines that are made for this can tilt upright. So they go up, which uses less water um, because the whole thing doesn't need to be filled with water. You just fill the portion that the person is residing in or resting in. And so then also all of the cremated remains at the end settle to the bottom so they don't have to be 
kind of collected from other areas within the, the machine. So. so when someone arrives, when a body arrives at the facility, they are unclothed, they are, their clothing is removed, and a plastic type covering is placed on them. So they're not just exposed before they're placed in the basket. And that covering disintegrates during the process, so that's not part of, of what is left in there. But clothing would not disintegrate during the process. And so this way, there is less material left over when the process is done and everything is, is collected out. Um, because implants are still there, any fillings, jewelry, things that, as Ryan said, would melt during a flame cremation are still intact during this process. Um, so if the person had been autopsied and they had a suture in them or you know the, the string that they were sewn together with, that would be in the machine as well with the cremated remains. So those things would all be pulled out, separated out, then the bone is taken and actually dried before it is kind of cremulated down into the end result cremated remains. The taller you are, the more cremated remains there are going to be, and men typically will yield more cremated remains than women. So it doesn't matter the weight, it's about the height and the gender actually, which I thought was really interesting. Now, the Ryan's often asked what is left besides the cremated remains? What does the water look like? What is the material look like that's in there. It's often referred to as sludge or slime or goop as if it's this thick runoff consistency which is very untrue. It's actually a little bit like muddy water or coffee with creamer in it that it's just a, um, a water that's a little browned that you can't see through as well. Um, so it's definitely a misconception that there's this big sludge and, and goopy water left afterwards. I think one of the things that is almost offensively saying that they hear negative is, ooh, grandma's going down the drain, because it is the, the body of the person that is essentially left and it is going into, this, you know, into the drain. However, with fire cremation, they're going up into smoke, or with embalming, you know, the blood is being Put down the drain as well. It goes into the common drain. So part of a person, if you, you know, dispose of them, have a final disposition that is not just direct burial into the ground, is going to go somewhere else. There is no put them all together unless you do just keep them together in, in one body and place them in the ground. So you have to be comfortable with which option you choose and saying, oh, we're going to put grandma down the drain is just throwing negative comments at one of the options, just like you can throw negative comments at every option. Um, one major question, too, was how large of a person can use this process? Because with a fire cremation, you know, if the, it depends on the person's body size, how heavy a person can be to fit in the retort same is going to be with this process. However, um, it cannot handle as large of a person. Um, around 400 pounds is going to be maximum because the person has to fit within that basket that the person lays in the bottom basket and a top basket is placed on top and they are placed into the machine. So if that basket can't fit around somebody, then it can't happen, the process cannot happen. So they can be a little heavier if they're taller and longer, but if they're shorter and wider, it, they will not fit into the actual machine. So size is going to be one hindrance for people selecting this option um, when you're looking at, you know, all the choices. Um, one thing that I thought was kind of cool about this, because it takes such a long time, a six to eight hour time frame, for one cremation to happen. I asked Ryan, you know, are you doing these round the clock? Kind of, how does this work? And he said what facilities will do is, you know, they're locked, they have alarm systems, and so they can run the unit 
while nobody is there. They can turn the unit on, run it through the night, and then the staff will return, you know, six to eight hours later in the morning to finalize the process. And so I said, well, what if, what if the machine springs a leak? Like, I'm, you know, I think worst case scenario. And there's kind of an app for that, you know, a situation I never thought I would use the phrase, there's an app for that. But these machines are run on a computerized screen. And so they can send to a person's phone, just like a lot of machinery nowadays, can send an alert or an alarm or a warning that the system is offline or you've lost power to the unit or you've sprung a leak. And so there is this, you know, there's backups to backups nowadays with, with so much machinery and so many systems. And so that's another cool thing about this is there's this backup system to it so they can step away if they need to and that machine can still be doing its job and still facilitating the cremation. I thought that was a really cool thing. Um, as technology is advancing, it, it really affects every industry. So once again, I just want to say a huge thank you to Ryan. I loved getting to do this and educate myself, and he took the time and was such a class act. Like, he really has the compassion, has the eagerness to help people, and he has the heart, and it's in the right place for this business. So felt very aligned with him as a funeral director and as a caregiver. It was awesome. So I appreciate him showing me how things work with flameless cremation and I'm excited to see where this goes down the road within the industry because I think giving options is so important in a world where people don't want to be on just one path and so many people don't want the standard embalming or maybe a flame cremation because maybe flame is you know maybe the flame scares you and a lot of people equate the flame to hell or to the burning and they really don't want that but this is a much gentler option for them so love the options love the education so glad I could pass it on to you guys um, as always if you have questions about this process post them below myself and or Ryan will get answers to these questions for you. And of course, subscribe, and I will see you guys on the next video. Bye.